Given the current uproar, I think it only right to talk about transgender people today. This is an issue that over the last year I have done a great deal of research into, and if you would like to learn more about it, I would highly suggest YouTubers such as Blair White, who is trans herself, or Suit Yourself who is now considering himself to be a trans activist and has featured numerous trans people of many stars and stripes on his channel. I'll link to a Google Plus essay that I'm basically going to read to you from for the beginning of this video, after which I'm going to talk briefly about the bathrooms and my stance on them. So this essay is titled, To Those of You Who Think That There Are More Than Two Genders. Assuming that transgenderism is treated with hormone treatment therapy, since it is, I would say that it ought to be treated societally as a disorder, and thus once treated as a non-issue, excluding potential sexual partners with whom it's relevant, or a preference kink depending on how one manifests it in their behavior and whether or not one sees treatment. This is highly preferable to the currently predominant alternative of referring to the condition as a gender unto itself, and very highly preferable to the recent creation of a boatload of genders as prescribed by Tumblr. New York City, for instance, recognizes 31 genders, which I find to be just obscene because there's absolutely no credible evidence to suggest that such things exist. Now, in the following essay, I'll attempt to break down this phenomenon logistically and show you how I've come to this conclusion, because I don't doubt there's many of you out there who find this conclusion unfeeling or simply ignorant or bigoted, and I'd like to show you that this is very much not the case. For starters, I believe that biological sex is based on the sex organs one is born with. Anybody who contends this fact is just wrong, I'm sorry. I believe that gender refers to a state of being predicated by hormones released as a result of one's biologically inherent chromosomes. While it's true, according to the World Health Organization, that humans are born with 46 chromosomes and 23 pairs, the X and Y chromosomes determine a person's sex, most women are 46XX and most men are 46XY. Research suggests, however, that in a few births per thousand, some individuals will be born with a single sex chromosome, 45X or 45Y, known as sex monosomies, and some with three or more sex chromosomes, 47XXXX, 47XYY, or 47XXY, etc., known as sex polysomies. A few per thousand, though in my opinion, is not enough to break up a binary. These people are unfortunately considered to have a birth defect, because that is what we call observable repetitions of rare genetic abnormalities that happen this infrequently. I'm not saying that they are broken, I'm saying they are so far abnormal as to not be considered a category. Let me go on to explain. Rather than placing them in a unique gender category and sending them off on their way, for people who experience dysphoria, we offer hormone treatment and potentially surgery in order to help them feel more comfortable in a body and physical presentation of gender that they prefer. This is done because gender dysphoria is horrible. However, if gender were indeed non-binary, then how could someone even experience gender dysphoria? If someone is in the body of a male or female and isn't wired that way, according to the non-binary model, they ought to simply occupy their own category in gender 3, 4, 5, 6, or whichever, and actually be perfectly normal. This would render their suffering entirely biologically invalid, and believe me, transgender people do suffer. This also renders their 41% suicide rates, as measured by Ann P. Haas and Philip L. Rogers from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and Jody L. Herman and the Williams Institute UCLA School of Law, entirely biologically invalid. Yes, there are social factors involved in that number. However, estimates of the suicide rates of Jewish people within concentration camps in Nazi Germany come in at around 25% according to Lester D. in the U.S. National Library of Medicine, and that may not even amount for many people killed by the SS and framed as suicide. You cannot possibly argue that social conditions are worse for transgendered people in the West in 2017 than they were for Jewish people within concentration camps in Nazi Germany especially not almost twice as bad. To reiterate, it only makes sense to take hormones if your goal is to shift your gender from A to B, and you would not want to shift your gender if you truly believed that you had your own special category and were just fine in your current body as a demi-boy or whatever it is you identify as. 
This system panders to people who wish to identify as something special and unique without sufficient gender dysphoria, and this leaves actual transsexual people in the dirt in its wake. Additionally, to those people out there who are considering hormone replacement therapy, or HRT, this is a very serious endeavor. For starters, it is likely to sterilize you, and that's just the beginning. I'm not saying that if you're diagnosed by legitimate psychologists as presenting gender dysphoria, you should not consider this treatment, but do your research first. To explain the text between the lines, for those of you who missed it, if you are not diagnosed by one or more legitimate psychologists as presenting gender dysphoria, or if you haven't researched it extensively and thought about it at length yourself and with your significant others, then you absolutely should not seek this treatment. For anyone who is still not convinced, I can explain my position logically in the simplest possible terms as follows. Say we have biological sex, Y and X, and we also have genders, M and F. Then in greater than 99.999% of the cases, Y equals M and X equals Y. In contrast, only less than 0.001% of cases result in Y equals F and X equals M. No two people are the same, however nearly all of the people on Earth have their chromosomes, and thus their gender, in line with their biological sex. Those that do not have what we consider to be a treatable disorder that exists within the binary. Even if you want to view gender as a spectrum, which I disagree with personally, that is fine. You simply must draw a line in the middle of the spectrum, label half male and the other half female, then the spectrum will hold genetically for greater than 99.999% of the population, and the rest will still have a treatable disorder within the binary. I'm not trying to say that tomboys don't exist, for instance, or even cross-dressers. I know some of the former, and aside from choosing not to sleep with them, I will not pass judgment on the latter. Rather, tomboys are still women, of the gender female, and cross-dressers are members of one gender that prefer to dress sometimes or all the time as a member of another gender. That is fine with me. That exists within the binary. We still have no need for nonsensical additional genders because our chromosomes and thus the resulting hormones still line up with biological sex, just to varying degrees. Why on earth people think it's a good idea to pirate such ideas from Tumblr as dozens of mutually exclusive genders is beyond me. The only tangible effect this has is to completely screw up a system which has been effective for nearly everyone throughout all of time, and to give a bunch of Tumblrites another reason to falsely complain that they are being oppressed. To validate my 99.999% versus 1.001% statistics, I am going to quote the Intersex Society of North America regarding how many people are indeed intersex. Quote, here is what we do know. If you ask experts at medical centers how often a child is born so noticeably atypical in terms of genitalia that a specialist in sex differentiation is called in, the number comes out to about 1 in 1,500 to 1 in 2,000 births. But a lot more people than that are born with subtler forms of sex anatomy variations, some of which won't show up until later in life. That is 0.0006% repeating to 0.0005% of the population. For comparison, here are the CDC's statistics regarding children born with missing limbs. Each year, about 4 out of every 10,000 babies will have upper limb reductions, and about 2 out of every 10,000 babies will have lower limb reductions. That is between 0.0004% of the population, assuming a 100% overlap, and 0.006% of the population, assuming a 0% overlap. As a manifestation of intersex children, biological transgenderism is unfortunately a birth defect. Just as babies born with missing limbs are not given different body types, they will still be endomorphs, ectomorphs, or mesomorphs. Children born intersex are not given different genders. We do our best to treat them accordingly with the best treatment options medicine has made available for us and we try to fit them into the gender binary for the sake of avoiding their gender dysphoria, if nothing else. If you ask me, we ought not to treat such a serious medical issue with Tumblr logic, no matter how topical it is. Hopefully this essay has made it clear to at least some of you why I think that. Now I'm going to go on to a blog post that I wrote about the transsexual bathrooms issue, and the reason that this was relevant will become apparent quite quickly. 
Here is my personal opinion on this issue, and it's been a bit of a doozy, but it's nuanced and been through a great deal of debate. The bathroom law should obviously be left up to the business or institution in question so long as it isn't public, for starters. That is courtesy of the Constitution and of individual freedoms. So now we shall talk about public spaces. Schools are an odd bird, because I've seen this forced down the throat of middle and elementary schools where I live, as well as high schools and colleges. Regarding the former, and I would say high schools as well, this is unquestionably the worst place to implement such legislation. Take a great number of curious and often frustrated children who are going through puberty, then apply legislation allowing them to be in locker rooms and bathrooms with members of the opposite sex. It does not end well. The majority of rapes and molestations that take place between students will do so in such places, and they will undoubtedly happen there due to privacy granted to such places and the exposed nature of their occupants. Consider the children diddled and the like by members of the same sex in the past in schools. But in that situation, we were limiting ourselves to only the predatory individuals with homosexual tendencies, which is admittedly lower than those without. I've spoken to a number of teachers on this as well, who are quite concerned regarding the immature boys that would enter the girls' bathroom or locker room with the sole intent to peep on or flat out expose themselves to girls in their school. Proving such an act in order to stop this behavior would require cameras inside these areas. Whereas in the past, you needed only one on the outside to catch a boy entering into the girl's bath or locker room. Consider as well the trope of boys peeping on the girl's locker room. I myself at that age would have sold my soul for a ticket inside that utopia, so long as I could get around to being called a creep or violating the rights of the girls inside, to which I'm sure the majority of boys can relate. This is handing that to everyone upon a silver platter, and the girls in turn will be forced to be leered at, no matter what. Now let's discuss the public bathrooms elsewhere. The same logic applies, because there are no cameras in the bathrooms, and occupants are in turn exposed by nature of the area. The lack of cameras is similarly the reason so many drug deals go down in club bathrooms. Let me just say I might know. Does this not seem like a dream for the predator, assuming that we could switch out a crowded club bathroom where he would obviously be caught, with a vacant store bathroom where he would most certainly not be? Consider the case of Target where nearly immediately after they adopted this policy, a young man donned women's clothing and filmed over the stall an 18-year-old girl in the stall beside him. Such instances are indeed rare, but forcing and worse publicizing this issue has brought the situation to the attention of potential predators, causing the reverse of its intended effect. Regarding transsexual people, I see no real problems with them using the bathroom of their choosing, and provided they are duly on HRT or otherwise painstakingly dressed, as the person truly experiencing dysphoria would be by nature of their desire to accept themselves, then no one would notice this regardless. However, they would in turn never be questioned or considered to cause problems, assuming they simply went about their business as everyone else does. Any pertinent legislation only becomes relevant assuming that a crime was in fact committed, and the federal standing regarding gender of everyone within the bathroom becomes suspect. This would allow them to take legal issue with a man in a woman's restroom simply for being there, regardless of any criminal evidence that may or may not be left over from inside. I am, by many accounts, a strident anti-feminist, yet shockingly my largest issue with this particular bit of legislation is the protection of women and girls. I do feel for trans people, such as YouTuber Blair White, who presents as an attractive woman with supple breasts and the rest of results of HRT. Yet still she has a penis, as well as Persephone, who is a long-time cross-dresser that rejects HRT due to the inherent risks. The former would fit well in neither locker room, and the latter would be relegated to the men's bathroom, but their situations are such a small minority that they themselves understand and remain sympathetic to these issues. Besides, once they are governmentally registered as a woman, which the former has done and the latter has not, then they would actually be qualified to use the bathroom or locker room of their choosing regardless. The pertinent issue is in fact trans trenders, or people who do not in fact experience gender dysphoria. Personally, I believe that it would be disastrous to cater to such delusions any more than necessary, and I'm subsequently opposed to doling out the life-altering HRT like Pez candy to children, who oftentimes seek to actually stop in the middle at whatever made-up gender they see fit to identify as. I have written an essay on this topic, which I just read to you guys earlier, but again, I'll link it in the description, and I'll try to put some of my sources there. Overall, though, the issue is not rapes, molestations, or simply voyeuristic invasion of privacy, so much as it is the potential of them. 
This is important for the same reasons it is important to stop school shooters, despite its overwhelmingly low rate of occurrence, and the reasons that it's important to preserve the rights of intersex individuals, despite them being born at roughly the same rate as people without arms. If you take issue with any of my stances, again, I would urge you to just consider the essay that I've given you, consider all of the facts that I've brought forward, and if you'd like to present an argument that runs counter to my opinions here, that would be great, and I would love to entertain the discussion in the comments. But make sure that it's a logistically consistent and valid argument. Don't just ignore everything that I've said here and go, but ma, insert liberal or conservative ideal here, because I don't really care at this point. I'm getting it from both sides. For everybody else, I hope this was helpful to you in some way. Hope maybe you learned something, and I'll catch you later.